you are ready we can start to your presentation yes uh, no and Erdem hoş geldin tekrar uh, thank you for coming to uh, to our webinar to accepting to being with us coach uh, now we, we are ready to listen to you okay I've got some uh, slides that I'll share uh, and we'll we'll talk to those as we go. Yep. So I'll just start to give everyone a a bit of a snapshot uh, summary of of basketball and particularly elite basketball here in Australia. So the governing body, Basketball Australia, who employs me, we have 22 national teams, which includes, um, you know, obviously youth teams, junior teams, um, our senior Olympic teams, plus also disabilities teams, uh, wheelchair, and our World University Games team. So uh, the, the national program is, is quite large and trying to resource uh, all those teams is uh, is a challenge. Uh, at the moment, our men are ranked third on the FIBA rankings, and, and our, our women are, are second. Uh, you know, in the history of our program, we've had 34 Australians play in the WNBA, and there's currently 10 Australians in the NBA. Um, and at the national team program, and, and what we call the Green and Gold program, is is a key driver in, in everything we do. So in all our elite uh, player and coach development, it, it's all got what we call a green and gold focus. So in other words, we, we're not about winning junior medals. We're not about uh, winning league play. We're about trying to win uh, uh, Olympic medals and all the decisions in our development pathway are made around that. One of the, the key elements uh, that's allowed us to have some success is the Basketball Australia Centre of Excellence, which is in, at the Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra. Um, that's the Olympic training centre for all, all sports. Um, we have a, a fully residential program there. So we have uh, 14 girls and 14 boys engaged uh, in a full-time program we call it a daily training environment um, they're aged between 16 and, and 19 uh, and they're the athletes that we've identified as as potential um, senior national team players um, and we'll talk a little bit about how we identify them soon so they're all still in high school so they attend high school uh, during the day uh, and train either either first thing in the morning or, or early afternoon. Um, so they would have on average um, five team practices, two or three uh, small group sessions, um, individual sessions, and then they would have three supervised strength and conditioning sessions a week. Um, and and that's been operating since 1981. And, you know, this is some of the players there. All, all our elite players uh, have come through that program. Uh, I think the the Boomers team, so our, our men's team that, that finished fourth at the World Cup, 10 of the 12 players had come through that program. And our women's team that won silver uh, at Tenerife in 2018, 11 of the 12 had come through that that program. So... Uh, yeah, th this is a really key part of, of what we do and it allows us to continue to, to compete internationally. If there's any questions uh, along the journey, just, just ask. You know, don't, don't wait to the end. Okay, Coach. So how, how we pick those players is what we call our National Performance Program or NPP. Uh, and that's that's a program um, for 14 to 17 year olds. We have eight uh, states and territories here in, in Australia and each state and territory has their own program. 
with a head coach. So uh, all up, we would have about 600 players in that, in that program uh, across the country. And then uh, obviously that feeds into our junior national program, but also the Centre of Excellence program. Um, its focus is on, as I said, developing Olympians. Of course, we want to um, we want to have success in the junior age groups, and it's always great to win medals. But you know, as I'm sure you will all agree, our our aim is to produce elite senior players. So it's it's to produce professional players, and of course, produce uh, players that can go and help us compete at a world championship. Or, or an Olympic game. So the curriculum for that uh, is set um, as such. Um, and the selection criteria for that is geared around identifying potential Olympians. So it's not always about the best, the best kids now. It's about projecting for the future. And now, as you would all know from coaches, uh, being coaches, Often the, kid, often the young players that are the leading players in their age group end up being senior national players, but it's not always. And, of course, in the, now in the U15, U16, U17 age group, that's a guard-dominated guard, that's a guard environment. So if you were to pick the top 15 players in those age groups, I'd say 10 of them would be point guards, playmakers, or, or shooting guards. Um, just because the game's a little bit easier for them at, at 14 and 15 than it is for the six foot nine kid or the six foot five girl. So, um, you know, we don't want a program with, with four or 500 point guards because that's not going to help you win a medal uh, at the next level. So uh, the, the criteria there is, is who's, going, who's got the potential, both basketball-wise, um, intellect-wise and athletically, to compete at the next level. Um, so those players uh, are all uh, engaged in that program at their homes. Um, and it's, it's about very much about specific individual instruction. It, we don't teach a lot of team concepts in that. We do have an overarching style of play, but it's very much about getting them to develop um, their individual skills and their concept awareness. And we'll talk about how we do that in a minute. And then we would bring uh, two times a year, we would bring 50 of those players into the Centre of Excellence for a development camp where they would come in and our, our Centre of Excellence coaches, our national team coaches would work with them on a four or five day live-in camp um, Coach, can, um, I have, can I have one question at this point? Because yes. you said you, you can jump and ask any question. In this time period, you, you're going to have two times, two times a year, you're going to have the, uh, these camps, development camps. What's your yes. priority on these development camps? I'm saying the fundamental-wise, or you do some measurements, or you, you, you're going to just do some your basic stuff to improve? No, we, we, we test them physically, so we, we have physical testing. Um, we get their measurements, um, so we certainly do that, so we've got accurate data. Uh, and then the focus of those is concept development. So in those camps, we don't necessarily do a lot of individual skills because that's what they do in their own environment. Um, so we, we start to teach the pick and roll, we start to teach dribble handoff, we start to teach more concepts, not 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 necessarily tactical, but just concepts. Can they, can they play two-man game? Can they play three-man game? Can they create for themselves? Can they create for, for others? Well, we talk about 14 to 17 years old, right? Yes, yes. Because that's important for us to have pick and roll and, and et cetera. So you focus on that after 14? Yes, after 14, yeah. We, Thank you. We try and focus on, on individual skill, spacing and cutting prior to 14 years of age. So they've got a broad understanding of how to play. You know, can they space the floor? Can they create their own offense? Can they create for someone else? Um, 
don't spend a lot of time screening in those young age groups because we believe that until you can, until you've got individual skill, until you can play in space, until you can create your own offense, you don't want to involve screening. So. So this is our, our model for um, individual case management of identified athletes. So they're the, um, they're the, uh, the different phases of what we, what we do. So we have each, each of those programs um, will have a, a state team. So it, it's like provinces or regions, our states and territories. So um, each year we have a national championship where teams are selected from those states and, and territories to come together to play uh, at a national, a national tournament. We have that U14, U16, U18, U20. Um, we have the, the camps um, and then also some now professional clubs have academies, which is its own challenge. Um, you know, uh, I know that some of your professional clubs and their wonderful clubs have got academies which are very strong, but the challenge we have with that is we're trying to teach a national style of play and a national way of teaching young players and coaches it's very hard to tell the professional academies what to do and, and how to do it. And, and often they've got a very different motivation to um, everyone else. So everyone that falls under this, under this system has what we call uh, an IPP, which is individual performance plan. So every, every player in, in our NPP, so the national performance program has an individual performance plan. And what we do there, we identify what's, what key skill areas they need to improve, what concept areas they need to improve, and what physical areas they need to improve. Um, and that allows us to, to monitor them and, and track them and, and go from that. So of, of those players in that, that program, that they've all got that. Um, and as the program head, I've got access to, to all of that. So at least we can monitor, are they growing? Uh, are they becoming better athletes? Are they becoming faster? Um, we do shooting tests. Um, so we've just got at least some ability to, to have our uh, knowledge of them because one of the biggest challenges we have is the size of our country. If there's, you know, I'm in Canberra, We've got an elite junior player now um, in Cairns, which is 30 driving hours from here. You know, it's, it's you know, four and a half thousand kilometres from, from, you know, so we, the, the opportunity for us to see them regularly is limited. So we've got to make sure that we've got a pretty good reporting process and we use a, a network of coaches around that. The, our focus is on long-term athlete development, as we spoke about. Um, our, our, we we want to create uh, Olympians. We don't want to create fantastic 15-year-old players uh, because that's not a sustainable model. You, you need to continue to aspire to, to compete at the highest level and, and develop players and coaches that can do that. So we talk a lot about futures versus actuals. You know, we want to be crystal balling. We, we want to see who's going to help us in, in 2024 in Paris or 2028 in Los Angeles. We, we're not too worried about who's going to help us win an under-16 FIBA Asia event um, in October. Of course, we don't treat that poorly. We want to win and we want to compete, but that's certainly not our priority or our focus. Um, yeah, obviously all the coaches want to win, so it can can become challenging. And I'm I'm a I'm a coach. I want to win too, but we've also got to have the bigger picture in in mind. Maybe winning an under sixteen Asia Cup doesn't help us develop the next crop of Olympians. Maybe we need to take a, a seven foot fifteen year old that obviously maybe not help us win this this week, but can help us win on a bigger stage later on. 
So we always start with the, the end in mind. Um, an Opal, that's, that's the nickname we have for our women's team and a Boom is our men's team. So we, we spend a lot of time talking to the coaches. What, what's an Opal look like? What, what, does, what does someone who can step on the floor at a World Cup or step on the floor at an Olympic Games, what do they look like? What's their profile? You know, what are, what are the characteristics and the traits that we need to develop? So the three phases of our long-term athlete development program, uh, skill development, concept development, and competitive development. Um, and, you know, we think if, if we get a tick next to all those things, now we've got a chance to produce a high-level player. Um, the first two are pretty pretty self-explanatory. You know, do they have the, the basketball technique to compete at the highest level? The concept development is, is the three-on-three, three, is the two-on-two, two, is, you know, do they understand drive and kick? It's not really about set plays. It's about can they play? Um, you know, can they operate out of a handoff? You know, can they defend a handoff? Can they defend the pick and roll? Um, you know, can they play in transition? Can they play in a situation of advantage? That's what we talk about, concept development. Competitive development is, is really important. And that's, you know, again, can they play the game? You know, in, in the pressure of international basketball, is their game and their IQ and their athleticism, all those things going to stack up? Um, and so that's more our, our national junior program because they are about results. They are about trying to, you know, go in and win games. Coach. Yes. Uh, there's a question about uh, three phase of yes. uh, long-term athlete development program. Uh, what do they look like? And can you give us some examples about the skill, concept, and competitiveness? Yes. So the, so the skill, skill development, we have a curriculum. Um, I think I was going to share it with you. I don't know if I have. I sent you some stuff, but I'll certainly share it with you. We have a, a curriculum or a checklist of what a, you know, a player needs to do on both sides of the ball. Um, and we do that from a games approach. So we don't spend a lot of time teaching one on zero. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that the skills that they're developing and they're practicing in a game-like setting. So very little one on zero or one on air drilling. Um, it's a lot of one on one, two on one, two on two, three on two, um, advantage, disadvantage, because we think that's the best way to develop game ready skill. Um, we've got uh, a curriculum about how we want to teach shooting. We've got a curriculum about how we want to teach footwork. Um, and then through our national style of play and our coach development program, we try and share that as much as possible. Now, you know, it, it's not possible that, you know, the, you know, 50, 60 coaches that work in our NPP are all going to teach things exactly the same. But what we say to them is these are the common traits. These are the common skills that these players are going to need if they're going to go to the next level. So we need your help in developing that. Concept development, again, is done in that games approach um, setting. Uh, you know, a lot of three-on-three, three, you know, a, a lot of... And when I say three-on-three, three, I, I don't mean, you know, 3x3, three three, the, the different game. I, I just mean small-sided games is a huge part of, of what we do, as I'm sure it is what that you do. It's something that we've invested really heavily on in the last five years, small-sided games and a games approach. Um, I think we had a very American approach to player development, uh, prior to that, and I would suggest, and I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you guys, we've got more of a European approach now. Um, you know, we've learned from from a lot of research and a lot of study and a lot of conversations like this that, that the, pl the sort of player we have doesn't develop doing a series of drills coming off cones and chairs and, and things like that. It's They've got to learn by playing. Um, and the competitive development... 
it is comes by putting them in in, in um, game situations that challenge them. Um, like our centre of excellence teams play in the B division. So we might have a 16-year-old and they might be playing against uh, a 28-year-old um, pro that's coming down from A division. Um, and we always say if we win half our games and lose half our games in that league, that's perfect. Um, because, you know, you don't want to... You don't want to have a young age... They don't learn to compete if they win all the time. But they also don't learn to compete if they lose all the time. So trying to strike that balance is, is really important. Um, Coach, may I have one question at this point? Yes. Um, you, t you talk about having like a Division B games with the young players over there. Yes. Are you going to... I would like to ask, actually, you separate these players to the league teams in Division B, or you have one certain team, you bring those potential players together and make them play, or you just let them to be part of their organization and as a young player individual to be in this, let's say, Division B organization, uh, yeah. you know, separately. Yeah, it's a combination of both, Coach. So. Our center of excellence program, so the, the best 14 girls, the best 14 boys, they're in the program here at Canberra. They play as a team. They play as a team. However, um, the other players that we've identified that either didn't want to come, they didn't want to leave home at a young age to come to Canberra, or they're just not quite right, we case manage them. So we say, look, we would prefer you to go play for this club with this coach because they understand what we want you to do. Now, we, we can't dictate that and we can't make, mandate that. But, yeah, but you know, once they come to Canberra, you take care of all their needs? All of it, yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, the quote down the bottom is, is you know, the thing with long-term athlete development um, you need to be patient, you know, um, and, and, you know, the earth is patient and the game is patient. But if, if you start trying to, to take shortcuts because you're worried about winning an under-16 Asia Cup or an under-17 World Cup, you know, that, that can, can um, makes it very hard to, to stay with a lot, that model. So we have a, a national style of play, uh, Basketball Australia national style of play, and this is for females and males. It doesn't mean that our two national teams run the same stuff. Um, obviously, the coaches will do what they do, and there is a difference. But in terms of player development, we teach the girls exactly what we teach the boys. Now, the girls can't play above the rim, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on the other side of it, the girls are a lot more compliant and will will do as they're asked a little bit more maybe than a 16, 17-year-old boy. Um, but our style of play is, is a national style of play. And I've, I've sent the style of play documents to, to a couple of the coaches that, and I'm happy for you to share. So what is it? it it's, it's more about themes and an overarching philosophy is how we want to play and compete as a nation. Um, it's got to be linked to skill and concept development. Uh, it's no good saying we're going to teach players this way in the in development, and then we go play a different way. Um, like for example, um, you know we play out of overt space. Uh, we we play out of a lot of uh, pick and roll, dribble, handoff, uh, flare screen action. Well, it's no good then coming down and, and playing the flex offense with our national teams. So if we're going to have a, a, an overall program, everything's got to fit together. Um, it's about pr uh, approach more than specifics. And we want to, it's been designed to compete against the best. Again, um, you know, we're not worried about beating Fiji in, in Oceania because we're probably going to beat them anyway. Um, you know, we, we want to beat Turkey. With all due respect, we want to beat the USA. We want to beat Serbia. We, we want to beat France. So our style of play has to be one that's ready to play against the, that quality. 
You want to prepare to play against the best team rather than just the next team. Um, and it has to, when we were putting it together and, and our former national coach, Andre Lamanis, did a power of work with this, it's got to be, it's going to hold up against the highest pressure environments. So, um, you know, as we're putting it together, okay, so is this going to stand up if we're playing Turkey in Turkey in a World Cup? Is this going to stand up against LeBron James? You know, and, and that's how it's been put together. So offensively, and, and this, this links, the coaches are all taught this. The coaches are all involved in this process. So the three key the themes for our offense is pace, poise, and penetration, which in essence is the three phases of the shot clock. So the pace phase is the first eight seconds. What do we want to do that with that? Um, you know, what do we want to create? How do we want to use um, early ball screen? How do we want, where do we want our post to run? How do we want to shoot the three-point shot? We define all those things and we teach this from a, a young age. Um, the poise phase is that middle bit where we're running offense. And then the penetration phase is late clock. What do we want to do late clock? And what we're trying to do is not be predictable for a, opponents, but be predictable from within. So everyone's got a level of comfort in, in what we're doing. Um, obviously, like most countries, we want to play out of the drive and kick. The term we use is split kick extra. Um, and we use that terminology and all our terminology from the minute they come into the program at 14. So our national team in China is using the same terminology as we, we're working tomorrow with 16-year-old play here at, at the Centre of Excellence. Um, you know, we want to be really predictable from within with our shot selection. And we want to be multi-dimensional. Um, you know, we want all our players to be multi, multi-skilled. That's been one of the great focuses of, of, of the program for 30 years. You know, we, we want to make sure that that our players can do multiple things. And again, that's, that's more of a European methodology than a US methodology. Defensively, um, it's a big build around disruption. Um, you know, we talk about what we want to do uh, in terms of transition. So our rules around defensive schemes and concepts are the same from 14 to 30. You know, we want to, try and have a level of consistency. Now, of course, if we get, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we get Pablo Lasso to come and coach our national team, we're not going to tell him how to coach, right? He's going to do what he wants to do. But what he will know is all the players that are coming into the system have been exposed to these common things. Um, and terminology is big. We try and have as much common language as we possibly can. And there's just some of the, the terminology thing. Again, um, I'll send these slides for, and you can go through them. It, it's, I didn't want to make this so much about um, X's and O's. It's just more about how we do things and, and why we do it. Coach development and player development need to go hand in hand. Um, and my, my role primarily is, is coach development. Um, so we have four tiers of courses. Um, so we have uh, an entry level for the new, the novice coaches, right through to our, our um, fourth level, which is for national team and professional coaches. Um, and they range from... Uh, they range from two days through to six days in those courses. A lot of it now, of course, is delivered how we're delivering this online. Um, and uh, we also have some specific programs now in place to develop female coaches um, because we've identified that that's a major um, area of deficiency and also um, to develop Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands. So Aboriginal Aboriginal people are our Indigenous people. Um, 
and, and we've identified that that's an area we need to do better. Um, big focus, we have 40 to 50 coaches clinics per year. And I would say of those 40, um, 30 would be free. Um, run by the Federation, um, by you know myself, the Centre of Excellence coaches, our high performance coaches or our national team coaches. Um, so why 40 or 50? We try and roughly get to one a week because we've got a big country. And within those clinics, we teach our style of play. So we teach our terminology. We teach the system and, and the things that, that we want the coaches to go and work with young players on. Um, and that's been really important to get buy-in. If you're going to have a national focus um, and have some common have some common points um, through every level, you have to get out and teach it and get out and communicate it. Um, one of the big themes that we have is is more conversations. So, you know, less emails, more face to face, more clinics, more coaches workshops, more just more time with coaches. Uh, and we don't think you can do that online and we don't think you can do that through documentation. It, it needs to be done, um, you know, face to face. And you've got to foster a spirit of sharing. If, if your elite coaches, like your national coaches, aren't sharers, they, they're not willing to, to, to give of themselves, it becomes very hard. And we're really fortunate with our senior national coaches um, that they are have got a spirit of, of sharing. Um, the big thing, and it's just, I'm sure it's the same in Turkey, the better the coaches, the better the players. Now, while I'm sure that the bulk of your players uh, are in Istanbul and, and maybe Ankara, I don't know, but I'm sure there's regions within Turkey which we would call pockets of greatness. In other words, a small region that produces really good players, right? Um, well, you have to support the coaches in those regions. You can't ask them all at very young ages to come to Istanbul or to go to Ankara or whatever else. Eventually, if they're going to be elite, that's probably where they're going to end up. I understand that. But if you don't have a network that can present and provide the level of instruction in each region, it's going to be hard. Um, you know, and I, I don't know is like the greatest players. Um, and you know, I was involved with our national team and I, I know that you've had some, uh, Yilmaz and Alban and, and players like that. Are they all city kids or did any of them come from the provinces or, or smaller areas or coastal areas? What, what's the, what's the mix in Turkey? There are basically coach, uh, there are players from small areas, but to be honest, even they are from small areas, they are coming back to the centers, like you said, to Istanbul uh, in order to grow up. You cannot find players. There are many players who are potentially big, are coming straight to Istanbul or, or basically in Istanbul, and then they, they grow up basketball-wise. There is only one exception, let's say, I think uh, Coach Murat is going to agree with me, is going to be Bambit, which is one of the smaller uh, city, uh, actually town, but they are really organized to improve, develop their basketball in junior levels. So they have that organiz organization taking the players from small areas, but the rest is basically in stump. Yeah. And it, it, that's, that's going to happen. Like, it, it, as I said, 11 of the 12 players at the World Championships, 10 at the World Cup, um, came to Canberra, which is our capital. It's not a big city, but it's our capital city to come to our program. But, um, the, you know, we found that we've got to do a better job of developing coaches in the regions so when the kids do come to the big city, they're a bit more advanced, if that makes sense. Um, you know, and, and it just then their development goes like that, you know, rather than slowly. So. Um, and the other reason that, that we want to develop coaches nationally and, and create what we call our network 
is to find players. You know, um, it's all right to say that we're going to bring them to this big cities, but we've got to know who they are, firstly. Um, so as we develop coaches and we develop those relationships and those skill sets, um, we, you know, they're more likely to say, hey, you know, I found a, I found a player here. Um, I think I used the example uh, when I sp- spoke to a couple of you previously of um, uh, Nathan Jawa, who played at Galatasaray. Uh, he's from a town of 400 people, um, about 40 hours drive northeast of where I am now, in the middle of nowhere. But because there was a coach in that region soaring playing uh, at 15, saw the physical tools, then were, and he ended up coming to the center of excellence. So by developing that network, you're more likely to find those, what we call diamonds in the rough. You know, those players that, that are a once in a generation. Um, and then hopefully, before you get them into your setting, where you know, Istanbul or Ankara, wherever it is, they've had, they've had some development. They've had some coaching. They've been exposed to what you want to do. Um, and then the other thing that we do is we have a, a, a national coaches conference annually where we have about 250 coaches come in. Um, we do a lot of presentations about the program and player development, athletic development, scouting technology, you know, all, all those things. So, so that's, uh, I'm pretty, yeah, pretty sure that's. Coach, may I jump in here? It's yes, a, jump a small in. question. Yep. I, I want to ask you about like players' rights. Let's say clubs, clubs' rights. When you, when you select a player, pick a player from a small town and take him to the uh, center of excellence, what do you do? What kind of process do you have? Like, do they clubs or the regional coaches have around rights on the players? Do they get paid? Or like when these players came become pros, they got back to their own club. What's the process in Australia? Because we have like a big mess in Turkey about these rights and the transfer of the city. So that's why I'm asking that. Yeah, we don't have the... We only have eight professional clubs in, in all of Australia. Um, we have nine in our league. One's from New Zealand. So, um, so no, we don't have a, a major problem with that. So, if we, if we identify a player in, a, a, um, in Perth, um, we, would, um, we would make contact with, for in the first instance, with their, with their coach, the person that co- has coached that and had the biggest impact and say, hey, thanks for what you've done. We, you know, we'd like to, this player to come into the centre of excellence. We think they've got an opportunity to play for Australia, um, you know, but we wanted to come to you first and have that conversation. Usually, because there's, you know, usually that coach is a volunteer. They're not a professional coach. So they, they might be a school teacher who coaches, you know, after that. Um, we usually don't have a lot, but we go through a process. So we speak to their coach. Uh, we speak to their parents. Then we would speak to the president or the chairman or the CEO of their club um, and say, look, this is what we want, would like to do. This is what we'll do for, for the player. Um, and also, this is how we will acknowledge your club. So we, we go to a long, lot of um, work to, to make sure that if, if, if uh, you know, we, we bring in uh, Yilmaz, from her town to the center of excellence, we always make reference to her former club. We always make reference to her former coach, um, and and you know we would bring them along for the journey as much as as we can. But uh, we don't have a lot of problems. Um, if we do, sometimes those players don't come. You know, we don't get every single good player, every, every single elite player. Because sometimes they make a decision that they want to stay with that coach, they want to stay with that environment, they want to stay home. So what what we used to do is say, well, you know, if you don't want to do this, go away. But we realise that there's not enough good players to tell players to go away. (laughs) So (laughs) what we do now is we try and get a relationship with them and and, um, spend more time in their hometown. 
we don't have the issue of transfer fees or anything like that just yet, fingers crossed. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Welcome. There are two, uh, two more uh, questions, Coach. Yes. Uh, Nejati abi, lütfen. Thank you, Murat. Uh, coach, thank you so much for your invaluable presentation and uh, your information that you have given us. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to ask one simple question uh, about, uh, you mentioned about some of the issues to be a Opel or to be a boomer. Yes. Is there any very, very fundamental differences between those characteristics that you want the players to be? No, no, we, we try and make it because um, we're a, a country of 23 million people. So we've got to be very, very um, good with our management of resources. We think if we've got two separate things, one for the men, one for the women, it won't work. It'll spread the resources too much. Um, so we, we, have, um, we, we have our eight pillars that we talk to the, to the coaches and the players about, and that's across both men and women. Now, of course, when they get into the senior national teams, depending on the coach, we, we certainly allow the coach to put their own personality. But no, everything we do is replicated both on both genders. Is that does that answer the question? Was that what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. But uh, furthermore, can can you please also give us about those eight pillars? Some info, uh, some examples of those eight pillars that you mentioned. Yeah. So um, some are, they have to be in great physical condition. So we mm -hmm. we have banners. And what I'll do is I'll send it to Marat to share with Please. everyone. We have, we have banners at our center of excellence with all those pillars. And we have pictures uh, on those banners of our best players, uh, Andrew Bogut, Lauren Jackson, Patrick Mills, da, da, da. One is they have to be in great physical condition. Uh, another one is what we call relentless persistence. So they, they have to be a toughness. They have to be a, a, a competitor. Mm -hmm. um, another one is the ability to make others better. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're more themes. Um, uh, one is, is uh, uh, an Australian player is versatile. So, mm -hmm. you know, they can play multiple positions. They can play multiple styles. But, yeah, I'm more than happy to send those to you. They're, you know, they're just something that was developed um, probably about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we, we liked it. And, and, it's, and now we've got generations of players that have been brought up with those values. So. Thank you so much, Coach. Thank you very much. And well, we will appreciate if you can send them over. Thank you. I will do. Yep. Uh, Mori abi, your turn. No, Coach, uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, assistance to the Turkish uh, basketball. <laughs> uh, uh, my question is, uh, until you choose the kids to the national level at age of 14 to 17. Yes. And, and develop them uh, from that age. Yes. They come yes. from a large variety of uh, areas, uh, from large variety of team coaches, teachers, yes. Uh, yes. or amateur uh, coaches. And uh, talking about the long-term development, do you have a general Australian concept of a written curriculum, like in schools, of uh, about a basketball? What to teach, when to teach, how to teach, how to teach teachers to teach? Yes. Uh, through the ages, starting from the beginning, primary school of basketball, eight or nine years kids and to yes, reach yes. your style of place in later ages? Yes. Great question. We do. We, we have a program for uh, five to nine-year-olds. It's called Aussie Hoops. And again, I'll, I'll send, send all this to Marat. Um, but that's our introductory program, and it's a national program delivered by clubs. 
So, you know, we, we've got the curriculum, we give it to the clubs and then we rely on them to teach it. Now, of course, for five and six year olds, it's all geared around enjoyment. You know, so they're not scared of the ball, they're, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So seven and eight year olds, now you're starting to develop some skill because now they're confident with the ball, da, da, da. Um, and then we have what we call underpinning programs, um, which are the, you know, 10 to 14 years. And we've got recommendations about what should be taught, what shouldn't be taught. Like, for example, um, our strong recommendation is no zones prior to, to U16. So in, our, in any competitions that we run, um, it's illegal to, to play zone defense in, in U, U12 and U14. Um, and, uh, you know, our recommendation, for example, is no pick and roll uh, in U12. Because, you know, if, you, if we think if you, if you do that in U12, under 12s, there's going to be two players that develop, the, the kid with the ball and maybe the screener, maybe. And then the other three are just going to stand and be out of the road. Um, so two guys are having a lot of fun and getting a lot better. And everyone else might as well be go play football. So, um, so yeah, we do. And we have a lot of that on our website. We have a specific coach's website. And again, I'll share that with Marat and he can share that with, with you all. But in terms of how we develop that, we have coaches courses um, and we just started working with teachers a little bit more um, to, to give them the skills to, to at least expose the kids to basketball and basketball skill. But we don't always get it right. But yeah, there is a structure in place. Uh, uh... I, I meant uh, of a written curriculum, like in schools. Yeah, you have yeah, we do. A, yeah. a sequence do. of uh, of uh, things to teach and uh, how to teach with videos, the, uh, uh, reinforced by by videos, and uh, yeah. the, for all the ages, like you have in yeah. the in the in the schools, for reading, write, mathematics, and uh, so on. Yes, the short answer is yes. Let, let me just show you some of this really quickly. If that's all right, Marat, I'll just share my screen again. Yes, please. Yes, please, Peter. So this is our website, uh, specifically for coaches. And here's some of the curriculum documents that we spoke, speak about. Um, well, we have these as documents as well, Marcel, but so for example, this is our Aussie Hoops one. Hold it. So that's individual offense, individual team offense. So all of that has, that's our curriculum there. And you can see so offensive moves from the perimeter, leading from the post. So it's all drop down menus, all the skills that they need to, to uh, teach across the board. And then in terms of that, they're all linked to these videos. You see there individual skill development, uh, team offense, style of play, all, all those things. And then we obviously have documents, but as you know, if I was to give you a 50, 60 page document, you're not going to read it. So we try and make it a bit more interactive from there. But uh, again, does that, does that sort of give you a snapshot of what we try and do? More a bit. Yes, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's, and also, uh, that, that, then, then you can you can uh, you can send to to the NBA uh, players to to play with the LeBron James against. Hopefully, the Ho hopefully. But 
but I'll I'll share with you anyway, uh, Marcel. Hopefully, that I'm saying your name correctly. I'll send you the bigger document. I'll send it to Murat and I'm happy to share it. But it's like there's an Excel spreadsheet with 300 skills on it. Um, mm. And we thought that was a great document until we realized no one had read it for like four years. So we <laughs> had, to, had to change the way we delivered it. That I have sense. that. <laughs> Good. You, you'll be the one guy that's read it. So I'm very, I'll be very happy. That's that's a that's a, a precious uh, treasure. Very good. That's a treasure. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Erdem, sana Hayri abi'den sonra söz verebilir miyim? Hayri abi. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your valuable uh, information you have given to us. Sesini daha kuvvetli alabilir miyiz, Hayri abi? Biraz daha bağırayım o zaman. Bu bilgisayar hep bela biliyorsun. Thank you so much. Well, as Welcome. far as I see, and we all see, there is a system which has been made and looks to be uh, working perfectly. When, are you, when you are to analyze yourselves, what are the non-efficient uh, points or aspects that you're planning to do in the near future, if any? And the second part is that if a third country wants to be a, a new basketball development country, what would be the first three steps to be taken for them to be a good basketball com country? Okay, I'll, I'll answer them in, in order. Um, we're actually going through a review right now of our program um, and our style of play. And just to make sure that it's still, um, it's, it's still contemporary, that it still fits with our goals, that it's still helping with our goals. Um, but it's also, um, as we, as I, you know, I joked with Marcel that, you know, we got these documents that no one had read. We're spending a lot more time now developing video resources rather than documents. I, I'm a former journalist by trade. So I, I like to write big wordy documents. No one reads them. You know, they, I think they're great, but it's just Marcel and I that think they're great. Everyone else thinks they're terrible. So um, so we're just going through that review now. Um, the other thing that we're, we're doing is trying to support it with analytics now, you know, with advanced statistics. We've got some young coaches. Uh, you know, I'm a dinosaur. I, I don't understand that stuff. I'm not smart enough. But the young coaches do. Um, so they're adding some, some data, a lot more data behind it. So that's what we're, how we're reviewing it. I, I guess I'm... Like all you, I'm a coach, so I'm biased. But if you really want to establish a a, um, a program from scratch, uh, you know you you need you need to to establish um, you know strong leadership and, and be brave with that leadership. Sure. Um, you know. Uh, you want to be collaborative, but sometimes, as we all know, by the time everyone has their say, you know, we're not doing it. So you need really purposeful leadership. And it's got to start with coach development. Um, we talk all the time. The, the, the premise of our program, it needs to be player-focused, coach-driven, administrator-supported. So it, it needs to be player-focused, coach driven so in other words the coaches are the ones that are really making it work and then with all due respect to the administrators in the room it's your job just to give us the money so we can continue to do it um so you know that would be the the big thing but it, you need you can't have you know it's a chicken or the egg but if you're going to try and develop good players you've got you've got to have good coaches to do it so investing one of the challenges that a lot of federations have is they don't want to invest in coaches, you know, and then they wonder why the players aren't getting any better. Well, you know, the two have to improve together. So that would be, hopefully that answers it for you. Yeah, how about the third country? In terms of, sorry, can you ask that, that part of the question again? Sure. 
Well, if, if somebody wants uh, to follow your road, what were the first three suggestions of a new country? To, to who, who wants to be a uh, good basketball country, basketball-wise? What would be your suggestions? The first three steps, four steps to be taken. Yeah, I, I, the biggest one is do it in th what I call do it in 3D. And what I mean by that, don't do it through documents, don't do it through websites, don't do it through flowcharts, do it through people. Peer connection. You know, yeah, and you know, my job uh, last year um, in 2019, you know, I, ha I spent over 200 nights in hotels away from my family doing just that, you know, and the, because I just don't think you can do it this is great what we're doing now, sure. right? But, you know, when I send you the documents, um, the documents are fine, but they're not going to inspire you. They're not, you're not going to read those documents and go, oh, okay, right? This is what we've got to do. So, you know, my thing is it, it's got to be driven face-to-face. -face. It's got to be driven in an interactive thing. Um, and... You know, I, I used that quote previously, you know, the ox is slow, but the earth is, earth is patient. You know, is get out there, but understand that it's going to be small steps to start and, and patience is going to be really, um, really important. I think that, I think the, the other thing is sell a vision. You know, um, when, the first thing that you do when you get out, you've got to sell your vision. This is what we want to do. This is what we want to achieve. And this is how you can be part of it. Because that's the big sell. If I'm coming and saying to you, hey, I want you to coach the kids this way. I want you to do it this way. The way you've been doing it's great, but I want you to change and do it this way. Why are you going to do that if you don't feel you're part of the, part of the step? Uh, and the last thing would be develop you know, a curriculum. I don't like that word, but you've got to have a roadmap. If, if you just say, hey, let's get better, you know, you've, you've got to have something to fall back on. So. so valuable highlights. Thank you so much. Welcome, sir. One day, one day archaeologists will find your uh, documents <laughs> and they yeah. will say, these are valuable documents. <laughs> yeah, and they'll be in... Uh, you know, they'll, they'll be in some museum in Ankara and no one will have a clue what they're about, but you and I will enjoy it. So. Uh, Erdem, your turn, please. Okay. Coach, first of all, um, for sure, I'm going to be one of the person who's going to follow all those uh, documents that you have on the, on the website for our junior program. That's for sure, for sure. It's a great thing that you already prepared that database that I think everybody has to at least have a look on this uh, yeah. to see where we are, uh, where we, where we can going to go. This is first thing. Second, I'm going to have three basic questions. Actually, partially you answered the first one, but I'm going to keep that. Uh, my question was, when did you start building this uh, organization? You already answered uh, to uh, Nejati Abi like saying 30 years ago, right? You start building yes. this. Yes. But I'm, my, my, my basic question is when you start to get the, the profits of this, your products. So is that uh, Bogut is your first product of this organization or Joe Inglis or Pat Mills or, or before the place that you have? Because we need to learn also building such an organized organization how much you need to be patient also to get the product. This is my first question. The yes. second one that I know... Um, uh, that I know there is a big influence that I NCAA on, on uh, boomers, not boomers, Australian basketball, uh, also New Zealand basketball. Almost all the potential players are flying to, to states for NCAA organizations. How much yeah. the influence of NCAA on your uh, player development? Like you bring them such a certain level and then they, they, they take on another level, or you are against that, you say, if they, then they don't go to NCAA, we can bring them on, on a better level. And third question that I'm going to ask, uh, we had a discussion with Coach Ben McCauley, probably you know him, uh, with Coach Murat, for another session of uh, Australian women basketball. And he said one thing, that women uh, athletes moving to different sports, uh, and this is biggest defect for them. 
uh, developing their basketball organization. Do you have same problem with uh, men basketball in Australia? They are moving any other sports or still basketball is one of the prior sports. I know rugby is the main thing and I, I trust rugby to build a lot in New Zealanders and also uh, Australian sports bringing toughness because this is like a culture brings the toughness uh, on, on any sports in Australia and New Zealand. Thank you. All right. In terms of history, um, in, in terms of this program, the, the current structure, um, as I said, it started in 1981. Um, and probably the, the early success was Luke Longley. Um, Luke Longley came into the program um, and in, in the late 80s. And again, Luke Longley was six foot 11 at 16 and, you know, struggled to do two things at once, like, you know, jog and chew chewing gum, you know. But you saw that there was something there. Uh, in fact, my, pr my predecessor went across to Perth to recruit another player, which you may have heard of, Andrew Vlahov, who was a great player on our national team. Luke was backing him up. So Vlahov was the starter, Luke. So we brought both of them over. And, you know, so then in the women's game in 1993, um, we won a, a U19 World Championship. Um, and then in 1996, won uh, an Olympic bronze medal in the women. And all those players had come through that system. Um, so it took to get that level of success, you know, um, 15, 16 years. Um, and along the journey, of course, you're going to have talented players, um, you know. And in the men, yeah, that era where in 2003, Australia won the U19 uh, World Cup um, uh, with Bogut and those, those players. But prior to that, in 97, we were able to win the U20. So you're looking, you know, 15 to 20 years to get, and you think, well, and this is the problem. If you say to a group of administrators or club presidents or, you know, hey, we're going to do this, and I tell you what, in 15 years, we're going to be really good. <laughs> I, I think all the coaches will go, yeah, but maybe not so many of the, admi the administrators. That's, basi that's basically my point, because once we talk about all this structure with all the details, it's not day and night. You know, you, you, once you build that, you need to be patient, you need to be stubborn, and you need to believe yes. in that. And you need to go, go on that. It's not like going to be in a few years. You need to dedicate all the program on this. This is why I asked this question, because we are presenting right now something, but we need to be dedicated and give uh, really be stubborn. Yeah, and the other thing with that, Coach, is, is to celebrate the small wins. So while we would say, um, you know, that it took that period of time, along that journey, there's small wins, you know, so... Luke Longley went to the NBA in 1993, I think. Yeah. You know, we sell it, you celebrate that and, and you don't, you know, you, you've got a, it's a bit of a marketing thing. You know, yes, you know that it's a long-term thing, but every time you have a small success, you've got to tell those administrators. And if there's any administrators or club chairmen in, in the meeting, I apologise. <laughs> but, you know, as I said, athletes, Player focused, coach driven, administrator supported. So, so yeah, it's certainly long term. Um, the NCAA has been great to us. Um, Bogut, for example, you know, played in the NCAA system. Patty Mills played in the NCAA system. Um, Luke Longley played in the NCAA system. But as I'm sure you're all finding out now. Um, College basketball is becoming further and further away from what the rest of basketball looks like, you know, in terms of style of play, um, you know, the fact that, that we all play with a 24-second shot clock, they're still playing with 30 and 35 and, and these things. Um, and we found that, you know, we still have a lot of players going to that system, 
they don't always come back better and they don't always come back ready to step into international competition because the style they play over there, fantastic coaches, fantastic competition, but it's not, it, it's, it's so far removed from, you know, Australia versus Turkey in a, in a World Cup in terms of style of play. Just, I, I want to make the, the emphasis on that. We talk about European basketball and Australian basketball. We are trying to share the, you know, basics and etc. Now it's start to be like a fashion in, in Turkey and also in Europe, taking the players early to NCAA in order to make them a better player. So that was my question. Uh, I also believe in that it's not such a strong organization to develop really the players. It's becoming more and more marketing style and, and some of the big schools are just trying to get results. So they don't care about players development. Yeah, and look, again, it's, we have a lot of players go. Right now, we have 190 players in the NCAA, 190, you know. That's the ones we know. Um, but as you said, their job is to try and win games. So if you're playing at the University of, of Kentucky, uh, Coach Calipari, his job is to try and win the tournament. He's not necessarily worried about your development and you being a great player for Turkey or a great player for Australia at the next World Cup. That's not his primary focus. And that's no disrespect to any of those coaches. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not for everyone. Um, and we'll, what we try and do is have dialogue, you know, and we try and have some influence on in where they go. Not, we don't necessarily care where they go, but go and play for a coach that, that understands the international game, you know, a bit more. Go and play for a coach that's ex been exposed to different styles, um, you know, and, and just try and have dialogue that way. Uh, there was a time when, when our, basically none of our elite women went. It was only the guys. Now the girls are going too because I, I think they see the shiny lights and television and cheerleaders and you know, this great life, um, you know, so yeah, it's certainly becoming an issue. And what you do do in terms of your national program, you just lose touch points with them for four years. So you're really hoping that they come back better or at least, you know, but that's all you, is hope because you don't, you, you lose control. And I don't know if you guys are facing it, the colleges are less, they're allowing the kids to come home less and less. So maybe they're missing multiple summers playing for their national team, you know, and all of a sudden they come back, they're 22. The guy that stayed in Turkey and played on the, the junior national team for four summers in a row has now got 60 or 70 worthwhile games against high level European competition. So they're ready to make the next step. Those kids have got high level competition, but against other college kids. So it, it's, a, it's a fine line. Um, but uh, I don't know what it's like in Turkey, but it's expensive to go to university in Australia. If you can get a free education, uh, you know, I can see the attraction. Um, as a part, your final question about other sports, our, our foot, we have a, a national football code, which is called Australian Rules Football or AFL, and, and similar athletes. So we, um, we do lose the odd player to that. Um, and in the women's game, no, not so much. I, I, I think um, there's... I don't think it's a major, a major issue in, in the women's game. I think the athletes that we want to keep, we keep. And, you know, sometimes um, the second tier athletes will go to other sports and not that you want them to, but I, I, I don't really believe we've ever, lo we lose too many that we think are going to be an Olympian. Um, and it becomes a resource thing then, you know, do you spend time trying to chase and, and uh, convince those players to stay when in your own heart you go, well, they're probably not going to be, it's not being disrespectful of them, but, You've only got so much time, so many resources. Let's spend the time on the people who want to invest, who want to work, who, who want to 
be aspirational. So, um, but yeah, there's certainly more and more options for young players now. There's no question about that. Thank you, coach. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, any other question? I have one question, Peter. Uh, yes. You talk about coach, you talk about the players, you talk about the administrative, but you didn't talk about the parents. How you manage the parents over there? Yeah, well, what we do is we, we only coach orphans and we find it a lot easier. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah. it, look, it's, uh, we, I wish. Um, no, I mean, it, it, it's becoming more and more challenging, as we know, because now, um, you know, uh, when I played, my, my father said, that's the coach, he's the, he's the rules. You don't, that's it, you know. He says, do this, that's what you do. You would go home and you would whinge about the coach and your father would say, well, you either do what he wants to do or you don't play. There's not, I'm not getting involved. Now, as I'm sure, well, maybe it's not the case in Turkey. It certainly is here. Now the young player goes home, says to dad, I don't agree. So the, the dad goes, yeah, well, I'm going to go talk to the coach. You know, this is not right. You're being treated unfairly. You poor little thing. You know, da da da. All right. And I see some nods. So um, I guess it's happening with you too. Um, what we try and do is all the information that I've shared with you, we try and share with the parents. This is what we're trying to do. This is our aims. Here's all the information. Here's a summary of 30 years of research, trial, error, successes, failures. This is what we're trying to do. Now, I'm not saying that that fixes all the problems, but it fixes some of them because they feel part of it. I think part of the issue with parents is when they feel like you're keeping secrets. You're probably not, but because there's not that dialogue, um, but we, we still have challenges, you know, um, like I'm sure that you do. But, you know, one of the big themes that, that I say all the time to our coaches and to our staff is have more conversations. So I think in the past with parents, we've gone, I don't want to deal with them. Well, guess what? you're going to deal with them, you know? So rather than, than create a wall, have some dialogue, give them some information. Um, and, you know, but I also have another saying, you can't legislate against lunatics. So the crazy <laughs> ones are going to be crazy. You know, it's just how it is. Peter, you have 20 million population in Australia, yes. don't you? And you we do. have 80. So it is four times squared. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. So. Thank you, uh, Erdem. Thank you. Sorry, Coach. We'll be just connected with uh, Coach Murat's questions very quick. That um, talking about parents, is there any contract restrictions for the players about age limit for, for a professional contract and et cetera? Because it's another problem in Europe that so young ages, the potential players takes their agents and then they start to sign contracts with, with I don't know, uh, some amazing amount of money and then they have to deal with it. Once they start to deal with it, then families, parents get more involved because they want to make money out of their kids. So I just want to compare this culture over there with European and in, in Turkish environment. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that does happen. But again, smaller population and smaller market. So, you know, a young player, a, a young player, like the minimum salary in our men's league is uh, about $24,000. So it's about... 70, maybe 17,000 US dollars. Um, so it's not massive amounts of money. So there's not a lot of people that are, that's not going to feed your family. That's not even going to impact really your family, in, you know. Um, but there is people that, that, that do engage with agents. We just try and educate the kids. And the value of having them in this program 
the NPP is we do seminars on this from the minute they come in. So when they're 14, we start talking to them about agents and, and contracts and, and opportunities and what they need to do. Now, again... Well, sorry, it... that's perfect. 14 years old, you start talking with kids, try to convince them, right? They, you start around 14 about that. Yeah, and, and again, you, you've got to, because they're so young, you've got to involve their parents. But, you know, you, you can't complain about something if you don't be proactive in, in the first place. So if you can engage them and talk about those things and whatever else, but it doesn't mean um, they don't do it. We have, when the players come to the Centre of Excellence, they have an athlete agreement which they sign and their parents sign, which gives us, not control, but, it, but they can't just disappear and go and do something with a pro club without going through some steps because there's an investment. You know, when they come here, they're on full scholarship. We pay all their, their room and board, all their meals, all their medical, all their school, all their gear. So if we do that, we need some sort of return. Not financial return, but, you know, if they just go off and start doing things, it's, it doesn't help us. We don't get any return on investment. So. Thank you, Coach. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Hi, Ravi. Well, Peter, I'm so happy now. Uh, we have a saying, uh, not we, I have a saying, the best parent is the dead parent. <laughs> so, <laughs> how nice to, to hear it from an international character like yourself. So, wish you luck in your national orphanage in your relation with the National Orphanage Organization over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, we, we actually have now a number of players, uh, young players, which, who are the children of, of former players that have come through this system. So initially, we're like, oh, this would be great. They know the system. But you know what? They know the system, so it's not great, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Sometimes a little bit of information is a dangerous thing. But as I said, more conversations. If you, if you create an us against them, that's exactly what it'll be. So. Yeah, communication, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome. Any other questions? Any other questions? <laughs> Zafer Abi? Yes. Hi, Coach. Uh, thank you very, uh, very much for your... Uh, information about uh, your uh, basketball i want to ask you this about women basketball as you know yes. uh, you are in the second place in the world ranking in after uh, united states and you have great players like uh, liz cambage and lauren jackson uh, penny taylor she had played in turkey for yes. and uh, in, in the clinics in basketball coaching clinics you said you are doing a special uh, coaching clinic for uh, females. The, the, are you going to separate uh, those coaches that uh, are coaching in uh, women basketball? Or you said something like that while talking about the coach. Yeah, no, we, we are running a program for female coaches. Not, not like it, it, we just realized that we don't have a lot of, our, our national coach right now is, is a woman. Um, she coaches in the WNBA, former player. Um, but, but yeah, we, those, those, that's a course to develop female co elite female coaches because we, we don't think we have enough. But, um, but everything else is done. You know, what we do for the men, we do for the women. What we do for the girls, we do for the boys, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I'll write that. I can send that to Murat as well, uh, coach for you so you can have a look at what we're doing with that as as well i will be uh, appreciate for that thank you very much i i wait for that thank yeah, you no problem no problem başka sorusu olan var mı yok gibi coach okay uh, thank you for great presentation and uh, your answers kind answers 
and uh, this is our 88th uh, webinar and we, we thank you very much for your time and for your cooperation and uh, end of our um, webinar normally always our guests give the last words uh, today I have a bonus from you you say that you cannot control if you don't be proactive and it was a very very important thing, thing for this generation especially so last words from you thank you very much uh, to join us you're welcome uh, guys a great privilege i have huge respect for uh turkish basketball uh i have some friends that coach uh, professionally there and we've had players such as penny play at, at Fenerbahce. we've had male players at galatasaray uh Bashiktas. so um you know to, to be able to connect with you all, huge honor and, and much appreciated. So I'll send that information to Marat and then he can distribute. Um, and that's a great thing about our game. It's a, it's a big game, but it's a small world and it's a fun, fun world to be involved with. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.